The seminar that we're doing today is called How to Ensure Fair Play During Online Chess Tournaments. Um, so we have uh, done a seminar like this uh, previously, um, and there will be a significant amount of uh, repetition if you've, if you've been to that session before. Um, and then we've updated a lot of the things with some of the new thinking that we've developed uh, on, on fair play over the last few months. Um, my name is David Cordover. I'm the founder of uh, Tornello. Um, prior to establishing Tornello, uh, which uh, actually was first built in 2008, believe it or not, between 2008 and 2012, uh, we, we built a platform to, um, to organize chess tournaments, but over the board chess tournaments, not uh, online chess tournaments. And so we had uh, an online pairings program and event management sort of system where you could collect registrations all the way through to producing results and ratings at the end. And uh, when COVID hit at the start of 2020 and everything moved online, we added some of the online functionality that, uh, that everybody's now using uh, because there's not much choice. Um, although we're hoping that in the next few months, the vaccines and the COVID cases will start to diminish and we can go back to running uh, over the board tournaments again, um, using Tornello, of course. So uh, I guess the question that, uh, that, that I like to ask is, you know, why are we here? Why are people coming to a session about fair play um, in chess tournaments? Uh, you know, what is it that gets us so worked up and excited uh, ab about this and so emotional about, um, about fair play in, in chess tournaments? And for me, it's, uh, it's really thinking about the, the very first rule of chess, the number one rule of chess. And you know, what, is, what is that? If you're a chess coach, you're probably teaching your kids something. Um, but FIDE has an opinion. Um, and the international laws of chess say rule 1.1 is that the game of chess is played between two opponents. All right? And um, it's not until rule 11.3 that FIDE talks about um, the fact that players aren't allowed to get any assistance or advice or information while they're playing their games. So, you know, if people are only breaking rule 11, you know, maybe you could sort of, uh, you know, not, not be too stressed out about it. But when you're breaking the very first rule of chess, um, it, is, it is quite a fundamental, um, you know, pain point for arbiters and for, for other players as well because we really want all of the games that we're playing online to be between two players, the same as they would be over the board. And as soon as you introduce uh, an element of, uh, of assistance, then uh, you know, that, that's breaking that very first rule of chess. And, and I think that's why it becomes so emotional for, for everybody, because it is, uh, it's so fundamental in terms of what we're, what we're trying to do. So I'm going to talk first of all a bit about, about us and as, as arbiters and organizers and, and you know, coaches, whatever role we play in tournaments, and how we should be uh, you know, kind of looking at things and you know, what, is, what are our objectives. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the players and you know, what motivates them to get assistance during their games. So firstly, as tournament organizers, as arbiters, as, as anybody who's involved in a, an online chess tournament, um, we're not trying to catch cheaters. And I think that's really important to, to get out there very early on to get everybody in the right mindset for, for what we're trying to do. We are out there trying to build a positive experience for the players who are playing in the tournament. Uh, and we're trying to build communities of chess players who trust one another, All right? If you trust one another, you have a good tournament, you enjoy yourself. When you've got a tournament where everyone's concerned that, ah, oh, probably lost that game because that person cheated on me, uh, you have a terrible, terrible experience. There's negative energy flowing around all over the place. And so it's our responsibility as uh, organizers and arbiters as leaders of these communities of people of players that we're that we're working with to set the tone in the right way to set the not just the right examples but also you know the language that we use the way that we talk about things to make it very clear that we're not out there looking to looking to get you um, you know we're here building a community of people who trust one another um, and John Stuart Mill's great quote, language is the light of the mind. So it, 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 language shows you what you're, what you're thinking about or how you think about things. And it's, it's um, completely different when you, you're out there talking about uh, you know, cheating and catching cheaters. So the language that we encourage people to use um, in, in this 
you know, if, if you agree with us that the objective is not to catch people who are cheating, but to build a community of people who are playing fairly, and in a community of players who are playing fairly, nobody's going to cheat. It's just not the done thing, all right? Uh, you get cultures that build up and people, people uh, in, a, in a culture uh, will, will tend to, uh, you know, kind of follow what their peers and their and their and their and their friends do. So if you're if you're on board with that idea that we're trying to build communities of players who trust one another, then the language that you should be using should also be positive language. You should be talking about fair play all the time. You should be talking about people who are making bad decisions or making poor choices uh, and and choosing to to get unfair assistance during their games. Right. They're not cheating, they're getting unfair assistance because that uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of just more descriptive of, of what, we're, what we're talking about. Um, I talk about teachable moments. So when, when players do make a bad decision, when they do you know, have a get seek some assistance during their games, it's a teachable moment. It's not uh, a, a, a moment for the guillotine. It's not a moment to throw somebody in jail. It's not about the punishment. It's about an opportunity for them to learn and to develop their own character and their own, uh, you know, their, their own, I guess, understanding of what we as a chess community are trying to do, all right? So it's all about building, building trust. Um, the other thing I, I like to talk about, and we'll talk later on about some supervision, is when we, when we select players to, to watch more closely, you know, you've got two ways to talk about it. You can say, we think that you're pretty dodgy, you're playing way better than you should be playing, and we think you're cheating, so we're going we're gonna to watch you. You're under scrutiny. You're under supervision. You know, our eyes on you. Or you can flip it and you can say, hey, congratulations. You are playing really well. In order to protect your good performance from accusations uh, you know, down the track, we need to supervise you because we as arbiters are on your side and players and arbiters should always be on the same side. We don't want to be, you know, be seen to be combative. That's what uh, that's what causes the negative energy uh, in in tournaments. Is when you're, you know, it's us against them. No, we're on we're on the side of the players, and so we're we're supervising you so that we can protect your good performance, so that we can assure everybody else at the end of the tournament that you have played independently, you've played fairly, you've played without any uh, assistance whatsoever. Right? And by putting players under supervision in, in that context, now they're going to be helping you as much as they can. Right? They're not going to be hiding things. They're not going to be trying to you know, get away with it. They're going to be out there helping you because they're seen or they feel that you're on the same side as them. Right? So these are some of the, the language choices that, that, we, that we recommend to set the tone, to set the environment right so that you can build trust. Um, punishments just don't work. So if you do get to a situation where you have to, uh, where you have to punish somebody, um, or we, where you find somebody has had uh, assistance, um, you know, punishing, uh, you know, banning them from tournaments, you know, re reporting them to, uh, you know, to, to FIDE and trying to get them banned for ten years, it's just, it's just not going to help. Um, in fact, it probably causes more problems than what it solves. So I'm always looking at fair play in, in tournaments in the same way that a community would look at uh, graffiti or shoplifting or some low level criminal activity uh, in, a, in a community. And, and we know, we know from, from lots of research into uh, you know, criminal psychology and, and you know, behavior change uh, in communities that it's Throwing, throwing every person who you, who you catch doing graffiti into jail is just going to cause more criminals uh, than, than, than it, any problems that you're going to solve, all right? So you, you turn people into, into hardened criminals when you, when you punish them severely. So, um, you know, we need to think about uh, re-education or education in the first place, you know, um, uh, and um, communication and forgiveness and, and building that trust with the players. So, I mean, this, this just shows you some stuff from the National Justice uh, Institute, which, which just, it's research that I've done uh, to try and understand, you know, how do, how do people in other communities who are dealing with, uh, you know, other but similar problems, how do they deal with it? And, um, you know, throwing people in jail just isn't really a very effective way to deter crime. And, and that's 
ultimately what we're trying to do. Remember, we're trying to build a community of players who are playing fairly, right? It's not about catching people who do something wrong because by the time they've done something wrong, it's too late, right? We need to get out there ahead of the problem and, and make sure it doesn't happen. And so with prevention, just the fact that you could get caught is, is, is enough. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go through some of the ways that we can, uh, that we can actually build some of this into our tournaments. Um, and, you know, just, you know, under, understand that, uh, you know, uh, you know, being more severe in your punishments is, is not going to be, uh, is not going to be uh, deterring the crime in any way. You're not going to have fewer cheaters because you've disqualified one person for 10 years for doing the wrong thing. Um, your, your, your best option uh, is probably going to be, um, you know, is trying to trying to build trust um, from the from the very start. Um, there is no silver bullet. That's why I've got my silver bullets on the screen here. This is not something that gets solved in in a day uh, or a week. This is a, an ongoing process. In the same way that making a community, a city, a country as a, a safer place to to live is not something where you can just deal with it in one go. It's about building the culture um, and each step of the way, just identifying the one or two people who are the, uh, you know, the, the most obvious, uh, you know, people who are, who are getting assistance, take out a few of the, the players who are cheating, um, demonstrate, uh, you know, as, as leaders in your community, forgiveness and trust, um, and then build that, build that culture um, and, and uh, you know, get the peer group to be your allies and working together with you. So, um, you know, so all the players who are in the tournament go, look, if you want to cheat, go somewhere else and do it. This isn't the sort of place that, that, that we do that. And, and you know, the, the community itself um, becomes, becomes your, your greatest asset. Um, there's a really good uh, um, visualization. Uh, it's kind of almost like a game, which talks about the evolution of trust um, and we'll send these slides to you afterwards. And so you'll, you'll get to see, um, you know, click on that and go through the process and kind of imagine that your chess tournaments are like all these little characters around the outside here and, and sort of see and understand how, um, you know, how fear and, uh, and suspicion breeds and creates people who are, who are not trusting or trustworthy. Um, and they'll they'll do the wrong thing, and then you end up with a culture where it's you know every good player has to cheat because if they don't, they're going to lose to somebody who's much lower rated, and that's really not fair. And you can see that logic, and that's completely you know completely sensible logic. And I've seen you know the top seed in chess tournaments cheating, and you think why in the world are you doing that? Why are the top seeds cheating? And and you know it's only when you kind of get inside their psychology that you realise well yeah actually. It would be unfair if they lost to somebody 500, 600, 800 points lower rated than them. Um, so they really have no choice but to use a computer to, to help them uh, just achieve a, a fair and normal and natural result. Um, so you know you've got to break that break that cycle and break that culture, um, and and you do that by just grabbing those the, the one or two people, weeding those ones out, um, you know forgiving them and letting them come back in the next tournament. Um, but uh, you know identifying that okay there's an education process that's going on and you're building a community of people who are who are then going to play fairly um, and we've done this uh, and this has worked you know um, we, we have a, a big series of school competitions in Australia um, we have you know through through 2020 we had uh, you know over a hundred tournaments online um, in the early days lots of people getting assistance lots of people cheating um, you know as, as, as expected, you know, particularly when these are, are you know, teenagers, but in the national finals, by the end of the season, um, we had 610 players or thereabouts, and, and not a single person was, was under suspicion um, in, any, in any way. So, you know, we're quite confident that there was 100% fair play with 600 people, and, and we had only a handful of arbiters supervising those people because we could, we could trust in the community. Uh, okay, so interesting question. Why do why do the players themselves uh, get assistance? Uh, and I get this question a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and and people people try and use motive as kind of uh, evidence in the in the case that they're building against players who are cheating. Um, so there are two types of 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 cheaters. I think um, there are opportunistic 
uh, cheating is, is what I call it. Um, and then there's malicious cheating and they are very different. Um, I think uh, my experience is like 90% of, of the players who are getting assistance, maybe even 95% are opportunistic, right? Um, and they might be doing that occasionally or they might be doing that like every single move of every single game. Um, but most people are not out there maliciously, deliberately, um, you know, doing the wrong thing. They're, they're, they're cheating. Um, and this is, this is you know, motive. Um, you know, motive is, is a little difficult to understand. It takes, it takes a bit of thinking, like, why are these people doing, you know, doing this, this crazy thing? Um, but I think we have, to, we have to really understand that um, just online, people will play badly, uh, behave badly in, in all situations. You know, it is not just online chess tournaments that people are behaving badly, but they're behaving badly on social media, they're behaving badly on forums, they're behaving badly in, uh, you know, in just all sorts of areas online. Um, and we have to get into the psychology, the behavioural psychology of the players themselves to understand that, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's not malicious it's mostly impulse control uh, issues. And so it's kind of easier to cheat than it is not to cheat. And so when you've got a situation where, where it's easier to cheat than not to cheat, uh, you know, water, electricity, people, we always take the path of least resistance. And so, um, you know, people, people will get assistance. So, um, you know, why do people behave badly online? Uh, you know, it's you know we we can throw some uh, you know some behavioural psychology terminology in here to make it sound fancy, but really um, you know people just they're anonymous or they feel anonymous, right? They they think oh no one will know who I really am, um, you know particularly on on a on a on a uh, on a on demand platform uh, rather than you know Tornello, which is much more for scheduled tournaments using real names. If you're using a, a username, you get that feeling. I mean, maybe everyone knows who you are, but you still get the feeling oh, that people don't know who we are. Um, you're, you're invisible. You know, you can't see each other. And that's you know, part of the reason that you have Zoom and, uh, you know, and cameras so that you can start you know, having a, a human interaction. You can see that there's real people in this. Um, you know, they, can, they can do something without an immediate consequence. Uh, and this is, this is really in, in, important, this, the idea of, you know, when, consequence, uh, when consequences um, uh, take place. And so, you know, we've seen lots of situations in, in fair play, you know, trials, if you like, where three days, four days, a week, two weeks after the tournament is finished, a player gets disqualified. Um, that disqualification does nothing to change the behaviour of that player because the consequences come too far after the action and they're no longer connected uh, in, in, in terms of psychology. So we want to try to have immediate, immediate consequences, immediate feedback, all right? Uh, if you've got dogs or children, you'll understand, you know, try to tell a, a three-year-old, hey, you shouldn't have drawn on the wall two days later is just, you know, you can't punish them for that, it's too late. Trying to train a dog, by you know giving them a treat the next day for something that they did yesterday, it's just impossible. It's not it's not working. So we need to provide immediate, instant feedback uh, so that people do actually learn and change their behaviour. Um, you know they see that the people who are who are who are um, you know who are getting assistance in their games uh, see their opponents in in a different way. Right? They they create this imaginary character in their mind. All right, um, both for themselves actually, and for their, and for their opponent. It's like, oh, this is who I am online, and this is who my opponent is, and you know, maybe they're getting assistance as well. So it's not wrong for me to do it. Um, and of course, of course, there's you know, there's there's kind of not much in the way of authority uh, online. So we can we can we can deal with a lot of these things, and we can solve some of these things. You know, we have an arbiter present, and that that actually demonstrates that there is an authority figure. Uh, you know in the game on Tornello, you know, in every single, in every single round, you can, you can hear from the arbiter's voice and you can see the button there on the screen. And, and that, that helps to, um, you know, to show that there are, there are authority, authority figures around. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, the, the, the problem that we're dealing with is, is what's known as psychosocial immaturity. Uh, it's the fact that um, it's easier to cheat than to play fairly. Uh, right, it is just so easy to have a mobile phone next to you and, and be be copying the moves, um, 
And so because it's so easy, the, the players uh, who, who do that, 90% of the time, it's not, you know, they're not being malicious and out there to try and, uh, you know, game the system and win a few extra dollars in prize money. They're just doing it because, um, because it's easier than, than the, the moral fortitude that's required to play fairly. Right. And so they're just, they're what we call psychosocially immature. It tends to be, um, you know, teenagers, um, you know, so from the ages of kind of 10 or 12 years old up to kind of your mid 20s, um, that, that is, um, a, you know, it's a biological fact that the, the people of that age, those age groups have got, um, they've got weaker impulse control. That, you know, their behavior in all walks of life um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's all about making bad decisions when you're a teenager, right? It's the experimental phase. It's, you know, it's where, it's where people do make bad decisions. Um, and you'll see that, you know, if you're, if you're playing online chess tournaments, it's the seniors division you probably don't have to worry about, right? You know, those guys have got the, the maturity to, um, to do the right thing. It's the, you know, the, the younger and the teenagers uh, who are, who are um, you know, just find it more difficult, um, you know, biologically, psychologically, they find it more difficult to do the right thing, right? They're going to be, they're going to be taking this instant gratification, this short-term gain, instead of, uh, you know, doing the right thing, which will give them long-term value and long-term gain. But, you know, in the short term, they might not get to win that game. You know they might not get to you know to to, to play a great move, so um, yeah, I guess this kind of under give us a bit of an understanding of the players why they're doing it, um, and you know kind of try to have some empathy for for the players and and to understand that it's a very rare person who is out there to really deliberately and maliciously you know impact a tournament and and do the wrong thing. Most people. Um, most people are doing are doing this just because it's easy, All right? So how do we how do we get in front of the problem and ensure that all of the players in the tournament are playing fairly? And there are three there are three uh, kind of core tenets that we talk about. Um, and if we get these three things right, then uh, then then I really believe, and I've seen examples of you know communities where uh, it's just you know it, people are playing fairly. Um, and people do trust one another. Um, and it's only outsiders from the community that maybe creep in and, and, and do the wrong thing. But very quickly, they learn that that's not, not how it should work. So um, we're going to talk about these three things. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the environment very quickly. Uh, then Eugene is going to take over and, and talk about some supervision and how you supervise players in their tournaments. And then uh, I'll talk a bit about the verification process uh, at, at, at the end as well. Um, before we get into that, um, what if we fail? This is this is a you know this is a, I think a really important question, right? This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to ensure that everybody in the tournament plays fairly, but we might fail, right? Sometimes people do the wrong thing, right? And I just want to put out there, you know, if we fail, we need to treat this uh, this process um, as a judicial process. Okay, so if, if we fail and if we find that there are people in the tournament who are getting assistance, we need to go through a process and, and treat the process in the same way as if it were, um, you know, a, a, well, to a certain extent, a murder trial, right? And, and we need to treat it as if it is a, it is a you know, a, a judicial process, which means collecting evidence, weighing up the evidence, making a decision um, and, and, and going through this as a, as a, as a process uh, not just uh, not just kind of ad hoc. So um, there are there are kind of four areas of evidence that um, that typically get drawn upon um, to to make a to make a judgment, all right? To make a decision. So you know we, we're going to we're going to be talking about the the you know these these environment, the supervision, the verification. These are things which will help us to ensure fair play uh, and make sure that people are doing the right thing. But they will also, um, you know, the supervision and the verification will identify players who uh, might be um, not doing the right thing. They might be getting some assistance and we need to supervise them more closely and uh, supervise them more closely so that we can collect evidence uh, in case we do need to disqualify those players um, and, and, and the sort of 
you know, I guess just to understand that it is actually, and it should be, um, a, a repeatable process. So the evidence that you're collecting as an arbiter, um, you should be able to collect some, some evidence. You should be able to make a decision on that. And if need be, you should be able to give that same evidence to a third person and they should look at that evidence and come to a, the same conclusion as you have, all right? And if they came to if they come to a different conclusion, then maybe you've uh, you know maybe maybe you've got something to learn uh, in terms of the, the the process that you're going through or the decision the the conclusions that you're making from the evidence that you've been seeing. So uh, it's really important that you know for uh, you know for for justice to be done and to be seen to be done, that there is the ability for um, for whatever evidence you collect to be then um, you know represented. To an independent third party, and that independent third party, with the same information, uh, should make the same decision, right? In the same way that uh, you know that that you know you give um, you know a, a particular chess position to uh, you know to to two grandmasters, they should make the same decision if there is the, a best move available. So evidence that we that we typically um, talk about there are, there are four. Uh, for, I guess, pieces of evidence that you would be drawing upon. And you would be hoping that all four of those uh, pieces of evidence are pointing in the same direction. So all of the evidence comes together to, to, to tell a story, right? And your job as the, uh, as the, as the jury, if you like, who's uh, you know, interpreting this evidence and, and trying to make a decision, is to try and understand what is the story that this evidence is telling us, right? And um, you know, really, you should be making a decision that somebody is getting assistance and disqualifying them from the tournament. If there's like, if there's no other story that you can think of, it's like, well, I can't really explain any of this in any other way apart from, you know, this person was getting assistance. So those those four pieces of evidence that we're looking at are um, statistical evidence from uh, from from somebody like Ken Reagan, uh, who provides uh, various reports on uh, on. The, the way that people play their games. Uh, so statistical evidence is, it, it can be very powerful. Um, any evidence from the hosting platform. So, you know, the Tornello Fair Play report and, and what that does for you. Some sort of behavioral evidence um, is, is ideal to have. So video uh, feed that you've recorded off Zoom that shows players who are holding a mobile phone in their hand, for example. And, you know, we've seen people who are, you know, just like, oh my gosh, Great, that makes my decision really easy because you've got a phone in your hand and you're playing you know, while you're trying to play a game online. Um, there are times where you, your behavioral evidence might not be so clear. So it could be uh, you know, people who are looking away from the computer all the time because their mobile phone's sitting off to the side. Um, but we've got, we've got some video that we can show you later on of a person who was looking away from the computer all the time that wasn't necessarily getting assistance. Um, and then there's uh, expert opinion uh, and, and so you can ask, uh, you know, ask a strong chess player to look at the moves of a, of a chess game uh, and, and seek an opinion from that person. Be very, very careful with that fourth, with that fourth one, with expert opinion. You've got to ask the right question, right? So if you ask, uh, okay, we need a grandmaster to come and uh, help us to, to, to catch cheaters. And you say to a grandmaster, hey, have a look at these games. Can you tell me uh, is, white cheating in this game, right? You've, you've, you've completely led the witness, right? You've told the witness what to look for, what to think about. You've asked them to look for cheating. Now, if they don't find cheating, they're going to feel like they failed. They're like, well, no, I didn't find cheating. And maybe, maybe now the organisers are not going to invite me back to the tournament because I didn't catch anybody cheating, all right? But maybe that's because nobody was cheating, all right? Um, so be very careful when you ask the question, hey, is white cheating in this game? You're really leading the witness incredibly, you know, an, an incredible amount. And so you need to ask, uh, you need to ask questions uh, that are much more, um, you know, uh, you know um, um, impersonal. Uh, so um, you need to ask questions like, hey, could you look at these 10 games and, uh, and, and estimate for me the rating of the player who was white and black in each of those 10 games. Now, five of those games are games that you're actually interested in and five of them are control games, right? 
Because if the grandmaster says, that, oh, yeah, in all 10 games, they're all 2,800 players, and you know that there were five games that are control games that were most likely being played fairly and they were played by 1,300 rated players, then you know that this evidence, this expert opinion, just really isn't worth that much because uh, it's quite clear that that expert opinion isn't able to, to, to make, a, to make a, you know, a judgment about the, 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 um, the quality of play in those games. If you ask 10, you know, somebody to, to give you, a, a, you know, an interpretation, what do they think the rating of the player is for these 10 games? And on the five games that people are playing fairly at 1,300, you get uh, somewhere between 12 and 1,500. So it's kind of in the ballpark. Um, and then you get some, you get, uh, you know, in, in the other five games, oh my gosh, in these games, white is about 2,700 and black is, you know, like 1,500. Um, and now you've got some, some, uh, some evidence that you can actually rely on. Okay, so just be extremely careful when you ask uh, for, for, for expert opinions, um, because, um, you know, I, I spent my, my early life as a chess coach and um, you know, one of the one of the best things to do as a chess coach, one of the most engaging ways that you that you teach is to show a game of chess. You know, you show from the first move to the last move, and you tell a bit of a story about it. And and always in every story of every game that that, that I that I demonstrated, you know, the person who ended up winning the game was predestined to win. You could see every move was just a brilliant move. Every move was leading inevitably towards this ultimate beautiful victory with these great teachable moments. Right, because you can tell any sort of story you want, you know, any sort of story you want about a game of chess. You know, you don't know what's going on below the surface. You don't really know what people were thinking about. Um, so it is, it is very, it's very easy for somebody to, to, you know, get in their mind before they look at a game. This is a game that had assistance, and then you know, use use that, um, I guess, knowledge to to justify their opinion. That um, that there was that there was assistance being used in a game. So try to be um, you know try to be neutral with the questions that you ask. Try to ask questions of those experts you know about the strength of the players, not about fair play or otherwise. Um, try to if you've got you know time and resources to to get some you know control so that you can make an assessment in terms of you know well what is the you know what is the capability of this expert. To, to really understand and, and, and give opinions about the, the strength of this, of this game. Um, because yeah, my, my experience is a little, bit, um, a little bit hit and miss with that one, right? So, uh, you know, in, in the early days, I, I got a lot of, um, you know, strong players to try and, uh, you know, pick games that were, that were getting assistance. And it's very, very hard. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, the, the fact that somebody has caught a lot of cheaters uh, doesn't doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know that's that's the person to ask, right? Because um, if you've caught a lot of cheaters, well, you're going to get asked back to you know to catch more, and then you're going to want to catch more. So just be be kind of careful on on that uh, expert opinion, um, and and the same thing for yourself if you're going to be taking an expert opinion uh, on on a game. Um, you know, really really try to be uh, as impartial as you can when you when you go in. Um, so there is there is one thing missing from from all of this uh, all this evidence, um, which is um, which is a rebuttal basically. Um, you know nowhere in any of this in this evidence that we that we tend to look at uh, have we got an opportunity for the player themselves to tell their side of the story. All right now, okay, people say, well, what's the point of asking a player? Uh, did you did you get assistance? Because of course they're going to say no, I didn't. Okay, so it's it's not about um, it's not about uh, you know asking asking because you want them to say oh yeah yeah I, I got help. It's because you want to hear their story, and you know you're trying to build a story, all right? And um, you want to see if this story that they tell is congr like congruous. Does it does it make sense? Does all the evidence point in the same direction as their story? All right? What what sort of things are they saying? So uh, you know in the in um, we, I had two two examples in December last year. Um, one of them where a player was, uh, was disqualified um, uh, unfairly, um, you know, that was, uh, that was a, a false positive. And when I talked to that player afterwards, I said, oh, well, look, you know, what if, um, you know, what if we were to, uh, you know, to try and assess your true playing strength? Because, you know, we've got this evidence showing that your rating of 
thirteen hundred is uh, you know you know you're, you're playing at twenty five hundred. You know, so how is it that you've got a rating of 1300 and you're playing at 2500? And, and the player told me, well, actually, you know, uh, firstly, my, my national rating is 2000 instead of, instead of 1300. Um, uh, secondly, you know, I did a lot of preparation with my coach and, you know, here's, here's the preparation. And that, you know, this player showed me on the screen on chess face, the preparation that was done. So you can say, oh, okay, that's interesting. It matches perfectly the first 19 moves of this game. Um, and um, and and you look. I would love to you know to be tested. Can you can you give me a test? And so I gave this player a test um, online under supervision. You know, controlling my mouse. Um, so there was no way that any assistance could be used. And and you know ends up with a two thousand plus you know per performance rating on a, on a test. All right. So all of the story that that this player was telling me kind of made sense right it, it's all pointing in the same direction they're willing to get a test they're they're interested in their own performance ability because they're like yeah i haven't played i haven't played a rated tournament for like two years you know so where's my where is my rating at i'm really interested to know um you know they're they're telling a story of preparation and home preparation with a with a grandmaster coach so that is 2600 rated play so you know if you're performing at 24 2500 maybe that's normal when you when you've got all this preparation um and so it all made sense the other player who, uh, in the end, we did disqualify, and I think we've made the right decision there. Um, when we talked to that player at the end of the, the games and said, look, you know, we've got this, um, you know, with this performance where, you know, you seem to be performing a thousand points above your rating. Uh, you know, what can we, can we, can we give you a, you know, are you interested in doing a test? And the player was like, oh no, this is a very stressful moment for me. You know, being accused of cheating is just like, it's really just thrown my psychology all out. There's no way I could perform, uh, you know, a, a, in, in a test. Like I just, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's just, uh, you know, it's just too traumatic, too emotionally draining for me. I, I, you know, I, I just don't think it would be fair at all. Um, you know, and then it was like, well, but what if I, what if I could get, you know, what if I could get, you know, proof on this test? You know, would you then, would you then, you know, give me my prize money, right? So it was quite an aggressive, uh, you know, uh, approach to it all, and you know, kind of told the story that well, why doesn't this player want to get tested? Why are they, you know, uh, nervous about this? Why are they, why are they pushing back in this way? Why are they being so aggressive about about the the situation? Why don't they seem to be, you know, you know, personally offended by the fact that they've been, uh, you know, wrong wrongfully accused? Instead, they're you know they're not sad and upset by this. They're angry and uh, you know and, and aggressive. Um, so it's quite it's kind of interesting to get that player's story as well. Not necessarily just because you're going to believe it, but to add that to your evidence that you've collected, um, so that you can you can kind of come up with a with a story um, in your own mind. Now, once you've got a story, then there's this idea of a burden of proof. Okay, so um, you know how how likely is this that um, that this that this that this actually happened, right? And um, this this is the the kind of typical um, burden of proof that um, that you would go through if you were studying uh, you know criminal justice or or law. And you know if you're a policeman and you want to pull somebody over on the road, you just need a reasonable suspicion, right? You you can pull them over and you can search their car or you can search their bag or something like that, right? Because you've got a reasonable suspicion. Right? You kind of think, well, you know, something's a bit, something smells a bit fishy here, right? Right? That doesn't mean that that's cause to disqualify somebody from a tournament or throw somebody in jail, right? Uh, probable cause. Okay, now you can get a warrant to arrest somebody. Now you can, uh, you know, enter enter somebody's home because you've got some probable cause. Um, this preponderance of evidence is is, is the terminology, but uh, essentially it's a balance of probabilities. And so this is what civil cases in when they go to court, uh, they decided on this uh, on this level of evidence called preponderance of evidence or or balance of probabilities. It's like you know I say you owe me money, you say you don't. We go to court, we argue about it, and and the the the, the judge or the, the jury has to make a decision. Well, if it's fifty one percent likely that you do owe money, that's good enough. We're gonna we're gonna put put that through, and you're gonna you're gonna have to pay the money. All right, so it's just got to be uh, on balance of probability. It's got to be that, yep, the evidence is a little bit stronger on one side than the other. If you go to a murder trial, 
Uh, then a murder trial, you're talking about putting somebody in jail for the rest of their life or some sort of you know, capital punishment. Um, we're talking about we need, we need a burden of proof that is beyond reasonable doubt. All right. So there is no doubt at all in your mind um, that, that, uh, you know, that, this, that this story that you're telling yourself uh, you know, actually happened. And if there is any doubt at all, then you, you can't convict somebody for murder um, when, when there's even the slightest doubt. Okay. Now we don't need to get to beyond reasonable doubt in in our in our chess tournaments. Um, we need to sit in this space in between balance of probabilities and beyond reasonable doubt. And this this level here uh, at the Court of um, Arbitration for Sport, which is where which is where it comes from, they call it um, comfortable satisfaction. Okay, comfortable satisfaction, clear and convincing evidence. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's what we would, uh, you know, here it says it requires a firm belief of conviction, right? It's enough to take your kids, right? This is, this is the sort of place where, um, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, if, you, if, you're a, if you're gonna come in and, and, and take somebody's children away from, from them for social services reasons, uh, you know, you need to be, it's better than 50%, but it doesn't have to be beyond reasonable doubt, right? We're not asking that, you know, that there is no doubt in your mind that somebody may have played fairly because as you'll see, you know, people sometimes play fairly for some of the game or for some of their games. And so it's actually almost impossible to, to reach that, um, you know, that, level of, um, that level of certainty beyond reasonable doubt. Um, we do need to be uh, in this middle level here. Um, just being a balance of probabilities isn't enough, all right? It's, it's really not enough. We need to be really quite certain. Uh, you know, so if you were doing it on, on numbers, this is 50% likely, this is 100%, you know, we're sitting here at 75%. So you have to be, you know, really firmly convinced uh, and, and, you know, um, really sure of, sure of yourself before you actually um, disqualify somebody. And this is really important to have this burden of proof so that the actual process of fair, fair play, um, you know, trials is a fair process itself. Because when you've got a process that is not fair, and if you're disqualifying people for just suspicions, then um, they're not going to trust you. And if the players don't trust you as the leader of the community, there's no way they're going to trust one another. And if they don't trust one another, they've got no choice but to cheat. Right? They have to, because otherwise they'll lose unfairly. Right? So for you as an, as an arbiter and a tournament organiser and a leader in the community to, um, you know, to, to build a trusting community, you have to you have to have a, a a fair justice system, right? And again, think about all of this in the same way that you would if you were talking about you know, local local petty theft, you know, local graffiti and crime, right? If there's an unfair situation where somebody can just walk into your house, take your child, and say, "Yep, this kid was doing some graffiti last night," throw them in jail, all right? That's you know that's the that's the start of a of a dystopian movie, right? That's not uh, a community that anybody wants to live in, all right? And so um, you know that's that's just not going to go well for anybody. So uh, I would I would implore you to treat fair play like a judicial process. Make sure it's independent and partial. Make sure it's open, transparent, accessible. That means talk to the players. I know this is something that really not enough people are doing. Um, they're disqualifying players without talking to them. Get on a Zoom meeting talk to the player, level your accusation, say, this is what we think's happened. Can you explain yourself? You know, give them all the evidence that you've, that you've collected. And, and you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times people will tell you the truth. But like I, I know people, you know, I tell people all the time how many people, uh, you know, confess uh, and, and, you know, and tell me that, yep, actually we got, we got assistance during the games and apologize and promise not to do it again. Right. I, I get, you know, I would say 75, 80% of people who are getting assistance uh, are honest about it, you know, because once we have that conversation, they understand that I'm not out to get them. I'm not trying to throw them in jail. You know, I'm talking about the community. I'm talking about building, the, the, you know, this, this trusting environment. And, uh, you know, when you have the, the right conversations with people, uh, you know, and they feel that, like you're on their side, um, you know, and, and you provide them with the evidence and you say, can you explain, you know, look at this statistical evidence which shows that you're way better than Magnus Carlsen. Can you explain how you did that? And then the players will just, you know, often say, well, you know, actually, you know, we did get assistance, right? Um, 
and and keep it keep it timely okay we talked about that before like if you come back three four five ten days later it's just not going to make any difference to them all right so um just quickly on uh, the, you know, back to our, back to our, what, what can we do to make sure that there's fair play? It's environment supervision and verification. The environment, um, uh, there's a few things that we can do to, to make sure that people are most likely to play fairly. Okay, first one, uh, having a visible authority figure, having the arbiter there who is speaking to the players at the start of every round, having the arbiter there where the button is there where you can click call an arbiter anytime that you want so that you feel like there is somebody um, who is an authority figure, right? It's the same reason why in any electronic store, you walk into the electronic store, you walk into a department store, they've got a security guard standing at the front. The security guard is not there to catch all the people who are shoplifting. The security there, guard is there to, uh, to provide a visible reminder that authority exists, right? And just having that person there just slashes shoplifting by, you know, half and more, right? It's just a reminder. So we wanna make sure that we as arbiters are out there. We're talking about fair play. We're not keeping it hidden. You know, don't, oh, hang on. But if I mention, if I mention people might get assistance, if I mention cheating, then that's gonna remind them that they should do it. Mm -hmm. Not at all, completely the opposite, right? Um, talk about fair play, talk about the community that you're trying to build, um, you know, be, be visible. Um, using real names, Okay, that, that combats the, uh, that feeling of anonymity, right? Because when a player is there as, an, as a username, I'm, um, you know, BlackRabbit22, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's easy to feel anonymous then, right? But if you're David Cordover in your tournament, then you're going to feel like you are yourself. And, and so using real names is really important. Um, if and when possible, repeat interactions also helps. So the same players playing against the same players, right? Building a community of people, Right. You, you'll see that there is much less uh, cheating going on in the local club championships where everybody knows each other and has played against each other face to face than there is at a, you know, thousand player, you know, international tournament where nobody really knows each other and can rationalize in their mind that, well, the person I'm playing against is the enemy anyway. All right. Um, yeah. So communication help, transparency. Um, and, and we've got this checkbox on Tornello now where you can set it, which just asks the players before they start their game, are you honest? And they have to click a button to say, yes, I'm honest. Uh, you know, each of these little things might help by 5% or 10%, right? But it's all about trying to build an environment where people feel like they can trust one another and the actual, the, the players and the community of players, um, you know, supports, supports everything. Uh, so I'm going to pass you over to... Yuzhina uh, Prokopova. She um, has got a huge amount of experience. Many of you know her already. Um, she's on the FIDE Arbiters Council, the European Union Arbiters Council. She's uh, chair of the um, Arbiters Commission Czech Republic. She's, uh, you know, lectures, lectures people about, about this sort of stuff all the time. Um, and, and she's had lots of great experience over the last, um, uh, you know, year. Um, doing online chess tournaments and supervising players. So um, her eyes are on you, our eyes are now on her. Passing across, uh, Eugenia, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David. Uh, before I start, uh, there is one question in the chat. Uh, in case uh, you are uh, having these chats with, with players and you are dealing with uh, young uh, children, uh, should you also speak to their parents or is it not necessary? What do you think? Um, absolutely. So, if you're if you're with um, if you're dealing with anybody under the age of eighteen, you should have um, the parent in the room with them when you have that conversation. Um, you have to manage that situation uh, delicately. So, you need to make sure that the parent doesn't um, uh, that the parent starts with an open mind. And so if the parent says, my child would never do that, my child would never cheat, um, you've got the problem that then uh, there's this public statement where the, the child has, has kind of been told that they didn't cheat. And so now for them to admit it, they not only have to come forwards themselves, but they also have to disobey their parent. So you have to be very, very clear with the parent that we're going to have this conversation. I want you to sit and listen. 
and and just you know have an open mind and i want you to make sure that you tell your child that you love them no matter what and you know we're going to talk about decision making we're going to talk about opportunities for um for you know for the child and for the parent to you know to create a teachable moment and and this is a great time if somebody has made a mistake and has um you know has uh, done the wrong done the wrong thing and and made a bad decision this is this is fantastic you know we should be really pleased about this because this this mistake this uh you know this bad decision has been made in, a, in an environment which doesn't cause any physical harm to anybody right and there are plenty of situations in life where you can make a bad decision right maybe you make a bad decision to drink and drive and you kill somebody right so there are plenty of times when making a bad decision that that impulse control where you just take the take the impulse uh you know can can lead to serious consequences right All right maybe it's somebody getting hurt or injured maybe it's something which is you know somebody somebody makes a, a you know a, a, the same type of decision right where you're like well i'm going to take the instant gratification and i'm not going to i'm not going to think about the future you end up pregnant right there's a lot of things that can happen right when you make bad decisions and so when the parents kind of understand that okay this is an opportunity to learn um, I speak a lot in that early situations in hypotheticals. I say like, if somebody got assistance, if that happened, and, and so that the whole start of the conversation is just hypothetical. And then I will ask the player directly. I'll say to the player, look, can you please, you know, come forwards and, and tell, tell me, you know, what happened in the games? And I'll, I'll set that up in advance by saying, look, I understand that, um, that people sometimes make bad decisions that's natural it's part of growing up it's 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 normal right um in fact it's much harder to um to you know to to do the right thing in a chess game than it is to get assistance we know that it's it's you know it's so easy to get some help in the game right but what tr shows true strength of character and true moral fortitude and what we would be really proud of is when somebody makes a mistake and they actually learn from that mistake. They own up to it. And it's it's much harder to make a mistake and then own up to it and learn from that mistake than it is to just do the right thing in the first place. So actually, if you did get assistance in your games and if you did come forwards and, and, and speak about it now, understand that your parents are gonna love you no matter what. Understand that you know, we're, not, we're not here to, uh, you know, to punish you. We, we want to make sure that, that we're building a community of people who do the right thing and we give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to, to learn from this, from, from this moment. Um, and, you know, we'll be really proud of, of anybody who comes forward and actually admits that they did the wrong thing. And so you make it seem like a great, like the, the best thing they could do is to admit to it. And then when they, when they say, look, you know, and then you can give them the evidence. You can say, look, you know, here's the statistics that shows you've got 65% move match and a 16 centipawn loss, which is kind of better than Magnus Carlsen has played in his world championship games in the last, you know, 10 years. You know, can you explain how you played better than Magnus Carlsen? Did you get assistance in like even one move of one game? So you can give them a bit of an out. You don't have to say, did you cheat? Like, did you get any assistance even in one move? You know, and I have had, I have had players so, oh, yeah, no, I got help in like, but just it was just for like five moves of one game, right? So they're not going to quite come clean and tell you that they got help in every move of every game, which, you know, is pretty obvious from the statistics, but they will at least tell you that they did something. So, you know, that's the, the kind of, you've got to set it up. You can't just jump on a Zoom call and go, hey, did you cheat? You've got to set it up. Um, but, and you've got, to, you've got to make sure that the hard part with the, with the kids is the parents is, is much harder because the parents are straight away on the defensive. Um, and so you've really got to, you've really got to kind of convince the parents to start off with that you are on their side, that this is normal and natural, that, uh, you know, that, that young people make bad decisions all the time. And if that happened, then that's totally okay. We're not, you know, it doesn't mean that the child's a bad person um, and, you know, kind of set it all up. And once it's set up, then, uh, you know, then, then yeah, it's it's quite um, it's quite common for the player to um, to you know to to come forwards and say, well, yeah, look, actually, I did get assistance. Um, but you've almost got to be kind of you know in there, especially with the you know the, the the sort of the tiger parents who you know you can almost see you know they're about to slap the child across the side of the head you know for cheating, right? Um, and and you've just got to get in there and really 
you know, kind of build a bit of love between the parent and the child. Um, so the, the child's not scared to, to admit it. Um, you know, they have to feel like, well, if we admit it, we're going to be, we're going to be congratulated and it's going to be a learning moment. And of course there are consequences for every action. So there's going to be consequences. Um, but in the long run, this is a really, a really valuable thing, a valuable learning moment. Anyway, so I'm talking too long about these sorts of things. Uh, Eugene, I'll let you continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I would just uh, like to uh, say a few words about uh, what's the arbitrator's role and how the supervision actually look like. And I want to start with some overview how it works over the board, because I think uh, there, there is a lot of uh, analogical situations and there is a lot of lessons which uh, you can take from that. And it's an area where we already have uh, some experience so it's uh, good to learn from it. And then I will just uh, shortly speak how, about how it works in hybrid tournaments and online tournaments and uh, give some practical advice from uh, Tornal side. Um, okay, so we, we all know that uh, the development of uh, technology helped a lot uh, to make uh, chess look uh, modern and attractive uh, because uh, uh, it used to be hard to uh, study chess with uh, lots of uh, books and informants and uh, uh, all the analysis that it requires to prepare for the opponent and everybody needed to have a very big uh, team to prepare and so on. But uh, today with all the uh, new things that we have, it's uh, much more accessible and much more interesting for people. We have uh, live transmission boards and uh, that allows us to have live commentary and uh, suddenly it's uh, much more easy to play chess but uh, of course it uh, has its, its own cost because uh, also you can use the same computers uh, to uh, get an advice to get an assistance during the game and already uh, more than 20 years ago, the computers were pretty strong, right? There was, uh, there was this uh, match between uh, Kasparov and uh, the blue computer, and it was already hard. And today, everybody who has a smartphone has a better engine uh, or has, be has an engine which is uh, able to play better than Magnus Carlsen. So that's... Uh, that's uh, tricky for arbiters because uh, now you have this whole new area where you have to uh, supervise people. And uh, in 1980, they uh, performed uh, this interesting test, like a Turing test. Uh, if uh, the a person who was giving a symbol will be able to tell that one of the players was getting an advice. So they had a computer and Bell Labs and uh, they were looking at the game from distance with binoculars and they were transmitting uh, the moves through some uh, headpiece uh, and, and so on. So uh, it was like the first case of cheating, but it was, uh, it was uh, uh, an experiment. So it was not uh, the bad kind. And after that, they asked the person if uh, they were able to tell that they were playing against uh, a machine. No, they were not. So. Uh, that's uh, how it uh, all started. So today, uh, when you have a game over the board and you have a position such as this one, it can happen that white is going to win because uh, if uh, it turns out that black has uh, their phone on them, uh, that means that he could have been using the phone to cheat. So even though uh, white is not uh, able to win in any series of legal moves, he's going to win the game because his opponent has a uh, phone. And uh, we, are, uh, we are taking this lesson. And in case uh, we are uh, uh, uncovering some cases in online chess, we are also changing the results. And uh, this is the same principle. So it's uh, not uh, something entirely new. Uh, when there were the first cases of uh, some uh, uh, assistance from the computer, there, were, uh, there was no possibility to uncover it because even if you were pretty sure, like uh, in this case uh, with Mr. Alverman, who was a uh, 1900 player, and suddenly he started performing like a grandmaster in one tournament, one time in his life, 
uh, everybody saw that uh, something is wrong, but uh, there were no uh, rules in place. So uh, the arbiters uh, didn't have the possibility to search them, search him or uh, to look if uh, there are some devices uh, anywhere hidden on him because there was no rule which would allow anything like that. So today uh, we do have such rules and we can search people, but it can it can get uh, very difficult. And uh, it doesn't always have to be so simple as having a phone in your pocket. And uh, how is it even uh, possible to, to tell whether uh, somebody is uh, playing for themselves or whether it's uh, a computer? Well, the computer often says uh, that this move is that much better than this move. But for a real person, uh, it in complicated uh, position, it is maybe easier to play a move which is a little worse, but uh, still winning and uh, is uh, getting in a less complicated position. Uh, it's more certain that you are going to win. And if you are in time pressure and uh, time uh, price money is on the table and everything is happening in this uh, one second, it is very unlikely that you will go into some very complicated combination. So this is how uh, on this time uh, people who were walking around were, were able to tell. But uh, always it is very hard to prove. So even though they were able to even find a store where he uh, bought this equipment, which was uh, uh, tailored to his needs, needs and everything, they were not able to prove it in court. So it is uh, uh, always a challenge. And even more so uh, because not all the players are on his level. And uh, for some players, you don't need to uh, get an advice in every move. Uh, just uh, maybe once or twice when there is some key position in the game and uh, you get the advice in the correct moment, then it can change everything. So there is this uh, famous story where uh, Kasparov uh, was playing in Las Palmas and he was considering whether to play G4 or not. And uh, there, were, uh, there was his team uh, in the backstage uh, looking at the computer. And uh, his seconds knew him very well. So they, they knew what he is thinking about. And they knew he should play G4 because it was uh, leading uh, to win. And at the end, he drew. And uh, the first thing he did was go to his team and ask, so should I play uh, G4 or not? And they told him, yes, you should have. Uh, but uh, there was nobody who walked into the room and uh, told him, OK, go for it. And that, was, that would be all that it would take. Uh, there would be no need to uh, give him advice and say, oh, you should play G4 now. Uh, he, they, they knew he's considering G4. And uh, the, all it took was to tell him, now is the right moment. So. Uh, for that, you don't even need uh, any communication channel or anything uh, very complicated. You can just agree that uh, if uh, the answer is yes, then I will walk in in a yellow shirt. And if the answer is no, I will walk in in red shirt. So uh, it gets even more even more tricky. And it uh, since it is so difficult to deal with these things over the board, uh, how uh, can we even um, attempt to deal with it when people are at home and you have no way to check them at all. On the other hand, this is uh, nothing new really, because even in a history uh, when there were no uh, computers, there were st still stronger players and there were teams of people. So even in game uh, Karpov Korchnoy, it happened that at one point a waiter uh, came in with a uh, blueberry yogurt and uh, all of a sudden the, the opponent was thinking well this must be some uh, pre-agreed sign and now they are communicating in code because they brought a blueberry yogurt and there was this whole argument about yogurt and after that actually it was only possible to serve yogurt of a flavor and at a certain time that was pre-agreed with an arbiter so uh, there were always uh, concern, uh, concerns about people cheating, but uh, nowadays uh, some people are so paranoid 
uh, that is very harmful. So we have to, uh, as uh, David said, so try to build an environment where people will feel safe and they will not uh, waste their energy of, on thinking whether my opponent is maybe cheating or something wrong is going on here. Uh, this should not be going this way. And they should just be able to focus on the game and not to worry about all these things. And this goes for over the board and of course for online as well. And there were many uh, real cases. You can start simple with just uh, having your phone uh, on, a, on a toilet hidden somewhere. And uh, then you can watch the behavior of the player and trying to find out some, uh, some patterns, what, what is going on on there. And if you see, well, they are uh, going away to the toilet very often, then it's suspicious. Or maybe they are making a move every uh, two minutes, even though if it's just uh, recapturing or it's complicated uh, combination, every time they make a move in two minutes. And uh, you are maybe not able to find anything in the toilet, but maybe something uh, there is something that you can find on the player. And uh, sometimes uh, they get very inventive and it's uh, not just about having phone, but uh, can be a more sophisticated uh, method. And uh, sometimes you have cases uh, which are uh, long term, and there is a lot of lot of talk about suspicion, and there is a uh, uh, lot of people uh, having tr trouble with it in a long term. But there is still no evidence, and there is no way to prove anything until one day it is. So uh, there were lots of uh, cases in over the board already. But it's a bit different because uh, you need to, uh, or at least I think you need to think more ahead and you have to plan for it. So maybe these opportunistic cheaters uh, don't have as much opportunity there because if you have some measures in place, it, uh, it gets uh, much more difficult. And if you are sitting at home uh, and your phone is just lying next to your computer, uh, the opportunity is uh, just there, and it's uh, not uh, uh, you, not su not such a complicated scheme. So, uh, what what we should be focusing on is that uh, these people who make uh, these uh, poor choices now when they are playing online tournaments, maybe they get used to it. Maybe once they looked only. Uh, to check whether the move I want to make is, is not a blunder. Maybe I will just look at this one move. And then next day, maybe I will look at two moves. And next day, maybe I will look even before I, I come up with some move. And before you know it, you are just uh, using your phone to play your game. And uh, my concern is what if, uh, since uh, you got used to it online, what if you uh, are going to bring it into over the board tournaments as well. And uh, for me, that is one of the main reasons we should be uh, focusing on this a lot and we should uh, work on creating this environment. So uh, we don't have uh, more uh, cases in the future. Uh, what are the measures uh, you can have in over the board tournaments? Uh, it, everything, everything starts with clear rules and uh, awareness. So uh, that's always more powerful than bringing uh, metal detectors and some sophisticated uh, jammers uh, or anything like that. If you have clear rules, what players uh, can and cannot do, if you have storage of electronics, so everybody knows uh, where to put their phone, if you have uh, uh, some rules about uh, should player to players talk to each other during the game, or is it forbidden, or uh, everything everything uh, like uh, where is a playing area, well, where is a playing venue, uh, what are what are the uh, spaces that I can go and I cannot go when it's my move and when it, it's not my move. All these things are uh, very important to communicate to players and to decide in advance. So you can have uh, uh, metal detectors and you can 
uh, check players randomly or check players on the entrance, but everything should start with uh, being clear about the rules and having a good environment. It's very good if you can separate uh, spectators from players. So you don't have that many unknown variables going on in the, in the area. But then also uh, it is uh, not so easy. If you have if you have tournament which is for top players and you can get all these people behind a rope or somewhere, then of course the, they have they have space and uh, there is nobody disturbing them and nobody who can give them any, any advice. But the same playing hall from the other side looks like this. And this is where the normal people play. And you cannot just uh, tell them they are not allowed to talk to each other. That's why they came to the tournament. It has a, a social meaning for them. They want to meet their friends. They want to enjoy the game. And they don't care about uh, these restrictions. And if you bring them, they will not play the tournament. So it's always about compromises. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, something that we should remember for the online events as well. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, that there are no exceptions. Uh, you are not there to uh, judge the moral integrity of the players. And maybe you know them very well, maybe they're from your club, or maybe you think they are too good to uh, think like this or whatever. There are no exceptions. Nobody in the world thinks that Magnus Carlsen is cheating, but that doesn't mean that we are not going to check him. And the fact that he is checked and uh, uh, there is uh, no exception is good for him because he, sh he shows as well that he has nothing to hide. So you have these different groups of people in, uh, in all uh, venues. You have players who, on one hand, they want to enjoy the game and they don't want to be uh, disturbed. So, for example, if you are checking uh, players before the game, it's OK. But if you are checking them during the game, then maybe it's already too much because you are disturbing them when they are trying to focus. But in the same time, they don't want to be connected to a game which is known for cheating. So uh, it is also in their interest that some measures are in place. Then you have arbiters whose uh, job would be easier if all the players played in one uh, glass box and nobody would be allowed to enter or leave and they would have their own facilities and their own refreshment area and they would never meet anybody else and everything would be uh, checked and so on. But you also have organizer who would have to pay for it and who would have to uh, uh, obtain all the equipment and uh, find a playing hall which allows players to have their separated bathroom and so on. So uh, as an arbiter, you are you are the connection link between these two groups. So you have to protect the interests of players in front of the organizer, because the organizer maybe does not know all the uh, fair play rules and all the um, all the stuff that should be in the regulations and that you should think about in advance before the game starts. And you are there to remind them the same way you are there to remind them that they need sufficient light in the playing venue. And uh, then you also have uh, the fans and the people who want to uh, spectate the game. And uh, uh, you don't want to tell them they are not allowed to enter uh, the building, because then you will have no people who are interested in chess. And that's not our goal. We want to have uh, people who uh, go to chess tournaments and who write about chess and who uh, spread the world. So, uh, if you if we would be to exclude them, that's that's uh, not a good ch choice for chess in general. So uh, you want to have some compromise, as for example, to have people in in inside but behind the rope or something like that. If the tournament requires it, it always is a question of how strong the tournament is and uh, what what is uh, the minimum that we need to do. Uh, to maintain the legitimacy of the tournament. And while you are doing all this, uh, it also has to follow uh, the general uh, rules which are above you. So if the tournament is federated, you need to follow federa federating rules, all, all other federal regulations. If it's uh, rated for national rating, you need to also follow all the national regulations.
And if you are playing in, a, in some country, you also have to follow all the laws in that country. So maybe you would like to use jammers. Uh, so there is uh, no transmitting signal in the in the playing area, but that's not possible because they are illegal in that country. So uh, it's not an easy job and you always have to find the best compromise for your particular event. And if you are, have a hybrid tournament, all these things uh, which apply to over the board apply to the part where players are physically supervised by the arbiter, because that's what hybrid tournaments are. You have players who are in the room with an arbiter, and uh, they, should, um, they should go through all these, all these processes. They should uh, be in a playing area which is prepared for this. And there is a chief arbiter who is in charge of all these checks and all these things. And they are also playing online. So how does it look like? They are together in the room. Uh, they are all have their device and they are playing with some opponent which is connected with them online. So uh, you have the part where uh, arbiters are working online, but also you have the part where they are working as it would be over the board. But instead of a board, uh, they have computer. Uh, they may also be allowed to use chessboard. And the main difference uh, from the online tournaments is uh, that the organizer is responsible for the internet connection. So uh, that is uh, maybe one of the reasons also why these tournaments can be rated, uh, because getting disconnected is maybe one of the biggest challenges of online chess. Uh, once uh, your connection is bad, either it's because uh, there is a blackout uh, in your whole country, or there is a power cut in your town, or maybe your cat jumped onto your router. Uh, none of these things are your fault. And uh, once you get disconnected, uh, there is uh, nothing you can really do. Because if you start to make exceptions, it can happen to you that you will have to award two gold medals. So uh, it's not easy. According uh, to the FIDE uh, online chess regulations, uh, which we have now and we didn't have last time when we had this seminar, uh, when you have online uh, uh, tournaments and hybrid tournaments, we have some written rules now which apply to them. So for hybrid tournaments, you should have at least one local chief arbiter and one local technical arbiter. And the technical arbiter is uh, exactly the person who is responsible that this uh, connection is stable and is uh, working. And in case uh, the game gets interrupted, uh, it should be it should be paused and then there is the uh, local chief arbiter who is in charge of the supervision and the supervision is uh, in this case happening in the in the room and now when we when we move to the online world how the supervision looks like there so we already know the first step uh, is uh, that you take away the anonymity uh, so not only that if you mm, do something uh, uh, something bad, it's uh, under your name, but also you know that there is a real person on the other end. And if you are using some assistance, you are hurting a re real person. Uh, then we all know that uh, the, uh, the players should have a camera and uh, their face should be fully visible the whole time they are playing the game. The room they are in should be uh, should have sufficient light so we can see them very well, and we should see them as well as the surrounding area, because uh, the surrounding area is actually their their playing area, uh, because now they are not playing in some venue but in their own home. But they take the playing area there, and uh, even though they are at home. Uh, the rules have to apply uh, to that space the same as it would in a, in a real playing venue. Uh, the camera feed from, uh, from a Zoom conference uh, can also be recorded and used for fair play purposes later. <clears throat> you can also ask them to have their microphones on and uh, be able to hear if uh, somebody is talking in their room. And uh, that can be helpful as well. On the other hand, if you have 
lots of players in one Zoom room, it can get a bit distracting. So now we are talking about compromises. Is it really worth it uh, to, to disturb all the players on the Zoom and have all the players not being able to focus properly uh, just for the low chance that somebody will be uh, telling somebody some move in their ear? Well, uh, if it whether it does or it doesn't, it depends probably on the level of the tournament and the level of uh, supervision that you want to have and the manpower you have. So maybe uh, if you think it requires such a measure, you would have to split players into smaller groups. But for that, you need more people who will supervise them. You need more arbiters. And to, to have that, you need more money. And what's happening in the computer? So uh, the main thing is that you should share your screen. And why are you doing that? Uh, so uh, arbiters can see uh, what is happening on your computer. And uh, that means that uh, there should only be running the Zoom and the playing platform, let's say Tornello, and nothing else. So to check that, uh, sometimes players are even asked to turn on their uh, task manager to show whether uh, there is some other program going on uh, during the game. And again, uh, is it uh, sometimes uh, necessary uh, or some organizers said you have to have uh, the task manager uh, on your on your screen the whole time during the game and now players are trying to play but the task manager is getting in the way and it's not very easy so again you have to ask yourself is it really such an advantage to have the task manager running the whole time that it's worth it to uh, make the player uncomfortable and not being able to focus on the game properly or uh, even uh, if you go even a step further, maybe uh, you are running the tournament yourself and it's not world championship, it's just your local championship. And uh, maybe you don't have that many arbiters, you are there just with one assistant or something like that. Uh, maybe it's not even necessary that all people share their screen all the time. As uh, David said, you, you can always say, well, you are playing so well, you are winning the prize, everybody will watch your screen now. Uh, so you have to consider what are the measures that are appropriate for your specific tournament. Uh, the other rules are that uh, in the playing area, so in the room where the person is, there should be no other people. This is another reason why you are uh, looking on the camera. There should also be no other electronic devices or anything like that. Uh, of course, beside the one uh, they are playing with. Sometimes, uh, according to the FIDE regulations, you can even ask the player for so-called remote inspection. So maybe you will create a breakout room in your Zoom call and you will ask the player to go there. Uh, then they will have to take their camera and show uh, they, their whole playing area. They will show they have uh, no second screen there, no phone lying on the table, uh, nothing like that. So this is another way how you uh, can check, uh, check players. You can even ask them to show you their clothes and uh, their drawers and anything like that. And you sh should just uh, not record this part if you are recording the Zoom meeting. And why are we looking at the players uh, in the first place? We are trying to uh, spot some, uh, some patterns in their behavior, same as we do over the board. If they are, uh, as I said before, if they are getting up very often or something like that, here we are uh, mostly looking at their eye movement and uh, how, uh, where they are looking just before they make the move. So we can have a player who is looking away from the screen. Does it automatically mean that uh, they are uh, looking uh, to the phone? Well, you have to watch them for a longer period of time and you have to uh, watch them consistently and uh, together with the game and see if uh, something else is going on the game and also something else is going on with their, with their behavior. Because uh, next minute, maybe he's looking at the other side and next minute he's looking uh, back again. So maybe he's just bored. He's not looking at any phone or any other device. He's just 
playing a little longer game and has nothing to do. So if you want to look away from the screen, doesn't have to necessarily mean anything. So we have to be uh, also self-critical about that. But if they are still looking at one place before they make their move, and they are doing it consistently, even if they are uh, low on time and so on, then it's a suspicious behavior. But as well, David show you later, doesn't always mean, again, that uh, they are uh, using uh, some unfair ass assistance. If you are writing regulations for an online event, uh, you should never forget uh, that there are uh, some rules that you should mention, like that you should not uh, award prizes before you do the fair play check and before you consider all the materials you have. Uh, what, what happens with the players who get disqualified? Will their results be changed or not? Uh, who is on the fair play panel? Do you have fair play panel at all? Uh, you should be uh, you should be familiar with uh, the platform, how the platform works. So, uh, in case of Tornello, that uh, you will be you will be able to uh, get an opinion if you want, and that Tornello is uh, offering to share uh, part of the legal risk as well. And what are all the, your options? You should also know how to deal with false accusations because. Uh, that may be just as damaging as uh, some cases of cheating uh, on its own. So uh, in, in case some people are accusing uh, others publicly in the chat, in the Zoom chat, or in arbiter chat on, on Tornello, uh, you should react to that as an arbiter. And over the board, we have these nice forms, and we can use them online as well. Uh, they can. Uh, say, well, I think this person is cheating if they sign it and they submit it officially, okay, but uh, just uh, accusing people in chat because they uh, defeated me, it's uh, not a behavior that can be tolerated. And if you need help, how to write these regulations, and you don't want to forget anything, you can visit uh, Tornello website. We have uh, templates and uh, some versions of uh, regulations which you can use if and you can copy the parts that are relevant to you and leave out the, the rest and it is it is there if you need it together with some advice how arbiters should uh, handle their fair play duties uh, some useful forms and uh, stuff like that uh, last last i want to mention is uh, that communication is very important and uh, not only with players, but also with each other. And since you are working online, you should be able to uh, take advantage of all the tools that exist online. So don't forget, uh, or don't be afraid to uh, create a WhatsApp group with players. Uh, no tournament is too small to have a small technical meeting. And you can uh, start with uh, informational emails and on Tornello, you can very easily export all the emails uh, of uh, or all email addresses from the players, and you can send them informational email with WhatsApp link uh, to join a group, uh, with a Zoom recording of the technical meeting, all things like that. And together uh, with other arbiters, you need some way to communicate as well, and uh, and. To, all the things that you can use, it's not just Zoom. Uh, for example, I want to mention uh, Google Sheets are a good way to communicate with each other. You don't have to uh, type message uh, player uh, X Epsilon is not on Zoom. You can just have a spreadsheet where you can mark people and uh, mark some information. And you can all share the same document and work with it and then it makes the communication easier and not as heavy. So you can find all these things on a Tornello website and I will just uh, show you very quickly where to find it. So our start here page uh, is, he is here and uh, you can find the links to uh, the regulations and uh, to all these documents which can be useful for you. So for example, uh, it's good to realize that uh, players don't know anything that you don't tell them. 
So if you want them to use uh, Zoom, if you want them to know how to sign into Torno, it's good to give them uh, something that will help them to do that. So you can have players manual how to how to do these things. And we have this prepared here in 11 languages. So it's uh, there for you to use it. We have some fair play rules if you are writing the regulations. I used it uh, this morning when I was writing a regulation. Uh, all the tips and tricks that you need to have in regulations uh, to be safe are here. And for the arbiters, uh, how to work, where to arrive, uh, what are the ways to communicate with each other, it's all described here uh, together with some uh, Zoom settings and uh, tips about uh, close supervision. Uh, about the spreadsheets, so this is this is the uh, basic spreadsheet when you will write all the names and you will tell your arbiters to check whether they are present and whether they are sharing their screen, whether they are doing everything they are supposed to be doing. Uh, for that, you need a good amount of arbiters. You can even have more advanced spreadsheet where you will have a separate cell for screen share, separate for camera and so on. Or uh, recently we added a different approach uh, with this spreadsheet where you can just mark the players who are being naughty, who are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. And you can uh, uh, fill in all the, all the names here and all the, all the stuff that you will need. And then arbiters can just choose the name, write uh, what, what's the issue. And if needed, they can write down some comments. And as a fair play panel arbiter or a chief arbiter, you can just look to the overview and see what are the problematic players in every group if you have multiple groups. OK, so all these things uh, are possible to uh, find on our website. And you can create a copy of all this and use it as much as you want. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great resources. Um, and we've got resources not just for fair play, but for all aspects of the tournament. So. Jump on, uh, jump on that Tornello homepage, uh, click the start here and download everything that you, everything that you like. Um, all right, um, we're, we're running over time as always with these uh, seminars. I think what I'm gonna have to do is um, one day we'll have, have a, a fair play webinar called um, How to Interpret Statistics. And we'll just do an entire, uh, an entire webinar just about interpreting statistics because I know this is something which people are really, um, really interested in. What I'm going to do is share my screen though now and, uh, and just go through some of what we call the verification process. Okay, so um, remember there are, there, are three, there are three stages to ensuring people are playing fairly. The first one is the environment. We've got a nice environment for all the players to play in. They're not very likely to, um, to, to get any assistance. That's the first starting point. The second one is the supervision, and uh, we'll be supervising the players to make it uh, harder for them to, uh, to get assistance. And then the third step is verification. Okay, so when, we, when we're verifying, we're verifying that they are playing fairly. So let's um, <clears throat> check out some of the verification reports that we can, that we can generate. So remember, um, I'll show you a couple of Tornello reports and how to read the Tornello Fair Play report. It's a success if nobody's cheated. Remember that. That's what we're aiming for. Okay. It is a failure when we catch somebody. It's a failure if we get a false positive. It's a failure if we uh, have cheating that goes undetected. But cheating that goes undetected is far less of a problem uh, because remember, you know, we, we can also assume that, that maybe, um, maybe, uh, you know, it was a successful tournament. So um, just very quickly, how do people cheat? Um, they might get assistance every single move. They might get some assistance on some games, but not others. They might wait until they're losing and then turn on the engine. They might skip the first couple of rounds because then that confuses the statistics a bit. And then, you know, Swiss, Swiss Gambit style uh, cruise home towards the end. Uh, they might use a bot, which is very unlikely. Um, 
when, you, when you're doing any supervision at all. Uh, it's most likely they're going to be using a, a phone um, and they can, of course, you know, just use, use, use um, assistance uh, as a blunder check. Um, don't expect to catch every single person who cheats in the same way that you would never expect to eliminate all graffiti from your city. All right. What we want to do is, is keep it into a, in a manageable, uh, in manageable situation. Uh, you're never going to catch it all. Okay. Keep it to a manageable situation, build a community that trusts one another, and then uh, it will, it will get better and better. Okay. So my computer is dodgy. All right, so let's have a look at some fair play reports and see some, uh, some, some examples of where we caught somebody and removed them. So you have to excuse my screen. Uh, it's going a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy. So here we have a fair play report um, on Tornello. And we've, uh, we've got a uh, you know, list of, you know, this is the top 12 of about 60 players in this tournament. Um, and I'll just go through this and explain why we, we took this top player and removed him from the tournament. Oh, let me just try that again, because my screen is going a bit crazy. All right, so um, the Tornello Fair Play Report is not designed to, um, to disqualify players. It's designed to provide you with a live, real-time, round-by-round indication of who to pay, play, clo pay closer attention to. Okay, so um, this is only one piece of evidence. You should be getting two or three pieces of evidence, which are all pointing in the same direction, right? And telling the story that's the same story. Okay, so this is just one part of it. This is a verification process um, that says, well, let's just check if the players are doing what they're meant to be doing. If they're not, supervise them more closely. Okay, so. Um, if my computer behaves itself. We have here um, the first column is the order of the players, okay? So in the, um, in the tournament, you will generally only have to look at the top three or four players in the tournament. Everybody below the top three or four is, um, is probably not too concerning to you. So the way that the fair play report in Tornello works is it puts the people who are most likely to be getting assistance, the ones who are most similar to a computer at the top of the list, and it puts everyone else at the bottom. Um, you can use um, comparisons amongst players in the tournament. That's one of the easiest ways, right? So you can see in this re report here, okay, we've got rating column, number of games played, score out of, out of seven what games, he's won six games, how many moves were played? Um, so now the moves column doesn't tell you just the number of moves that were played, but it tells you the number of moves that were actually assessed by Tornello uh, in this report, okay? And it will not assess every single move. So for example, we won't assess the, uh, the very first move of the game, opening moves, what's the point, right? E4, E5, does that mean that you're getting assistance or not? So there's no point assessing every single move. I take your queen, you take me, like, well, what's the point of assessing that? Maybe you were getting assistance, but it was just a really obvious move. All right, you're now a queen ahead. Like, it doesn't really matter what move you play, you're going to be a queen ahead anyway. So there are certain times where we don't bother assessing moves. So this will tell you the number of moves that were assessed. Um, anything below 100 moves uh, is, is probably not a great idea to make a decision on. Uh, below 100 moves is, um, you know, it, it, you can get much, much greater variability. Um, uh, excuse my screen, sorry guys. Um, if it's fewer than 30 moves, don't even bother, right? It's less than 30 moves. Uh, you, it's, it's just not really gonna give you very much of a reading at all. Um, but below 100, just be a little careful. Above 100 moves, you're starting to get some good statistical data. It's worthwhile. Okay, you've got your CPL, which is your centipawn loss. For those people who don't know what centipawn loss is, um, your every move, um, your the computer will make an assessment of the position. So it measures that position in centipawns, that is uh, one one hundredth of a pawn. Okay, so. Uh, a, 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 a centipawn loss is where you say, okay, the best move the computer would play 
would get you to three pawns down. But you played a move which took you to four pawns down. Okay, the best move was minus three. Your score was minus four. That is one pawn difference between the best possible move and your move or 100 centi pawns. Okay, so this shows you the average centi pawn loss across those 112 moves. So you can see that this number two player is blundering about half a pawn per move on average for the course of the game. Okay, so um, the move match is just, is just as it sounds. How many moves matched exactly what the computer would, was, was, was planning? Uh, so the computer's best move gives you the exact best move. But centi pawns a really good one because it shows you, well, okay, you didn't pick the computer's best move, but how close to the best move did you come? Um, in the Tornello report, and I like to try and keep things simple, if you're just looking at one thing and only one thing, what would the one thing you would look at be? And it would be the score column, this sort score. Okay, that sort score is the one thing that you really need to look at. You can kind of forget everything else and just focus on that one thing there. Okay, so what you can do with that sort score is that is a raw score. So it doesn't change based on the player's rating. Okay, there are some reports that you can, that you can uh, get where, you know, a grandmaster will be scaled. So expect a grandmaster to get a higher score, expect an 800 rated player to get a lower score. My screen's doing this by itself. I apologize for that. Um, so uh, here, uh, a score of 24 doesn't tell you necessarily anything at all. Okay, it just says that this player's got a score of 24. If they're a grandmaster, if they're a 2300 rated player even, this is completely normal. Okay, um, and then this analysis level just tells you what our engines are doing, whether they're, whether they're going through multiple uh, depths, and so, you know, you start at level A, then we go to level B, we add more things to level C, and then finally to level D. Level D doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, getting help. Um, level D just means that we've, you know, our algorithms have decided to continue looking at this player more than somebody who's just level, level A or level B. Um, the obvious thing here is that there is a very, very big difference between the player who's number one on the list and everybody else, right? So the player who's number one on the list has got a score of 24 and everybody else has got a score that's below zero. Now to put this in context, this is a junior tournament. All the players are below, 13, below 1400. Uh, so you can see the top seeds like 1350, 1346, got a couple of 1200 rated players here. So this is, um, and it's uh, 12 plus three, so 15 minute games, all right? If you, the faster the games, the lower the scores every time, all right? So if you're playing a classical time game, you would expect the scores to be much higher. If you're playing a three plus two, expect the scores to be much lower. Um, but straight away, you can get some sort of suspicion that's like, well, hang on a second, why is one player way out on 24 and, uh, and everybody else is down in the negatives? Okay, so we're gonna click on this top line and we're gonna now dig into that player and look at, look at the details. So this is that same player. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try and just, uh, okay, I don't know what's going on here. Um, so we, we look at that one player and we can see um, the, the player scores. Now, uh, we can see a score for each game. Now, remember, any one game, anything can happen, all right? Any one game, anything can happen. My magic numbers are in terms of sandy pawn loss, move match, and, uh, and sort score. Um, uh, Sandy pawn loss below 20 is extremely difficult to get. Above 60% is extremely difficult to get. So 20 and 60 are my magic numbers. Uh, anything below 20 or above 60, uh, I'm, I'm starting to say, what's going on here? Is this player a grandmaster? Okay. Um, the sort score will, will be um, dependent on the, the rating of the player. Okay. So a sort score... Um, of 24, you would really need a player to be, uh, you know, well, well and truly uh, above 2,000 rating for, for that sort of score. And I'll show you some sort scores of some of the um, some of the best players in the world in the European Club Cup finals, where we've got 11 players above 2,700, and you'll see in in a tournament of uh, how many 180 players or whatever it was. Uh, how many players scored above above 24 in their in their sort score? 
Um, so this now shows you round by round all of the all of the matches. Okay, and and you can see that there is just um, you know very consistent performance of move match above sixty percent. And so uh, sixty percent is a very difficult number to get. Um, most players will be scoring in the you know in the thirties to to fifties. Um, and so anything above 60% is extremely suspicious. Now, we, we noticed this player, um, unfortunately, uh, only, after, only after six games, and we asked them to play, play under supervision for the seventh game. And so when they were playing under supervision for the seventh game, they've got 13% move match, they've got 131 uh, centipawn loss, and, and a sort score of negative 118. So this is normal, okay? This is completely normal. For a player of this uh, of this caliber under fourteen hundred, you know, his rating is probably eight hundred or nine hundred. All of the other scores are not at all normal. Okay, 60, 66 sort scores, you know, um, you know, percentages of above sixty percent are, are not normal. It can happen in one game. Anything can happen in one game, but it's not normal over the course of the game. So um, this this result led to a disqualification because, firstly. Um, the score is uh, incredibly high by comparison to everyone else. Um, their sort score of 24 really is, is only something which, uh, which an international master or close to would be, would be scoring. Then when we look at the individual games, we see that the game that he played under supervision uh, was, was like way different from all the other games. So we were able to disqualify that player um, just, based on, just based on this analysis. Actually, this was a disappointing one because when I spoke to the, the player and the parent, the parent was extremely aggressive towards me, not open-minded at all, um, and, and told me, but he's been practicing a lot. He's got a grandmaster coach. Um, yeah, that's fine. But, um, you know, statistics don't lie. Over, over 100 moves, it's like you've just rolled a six on your dice. You know, you take a dice, you roll a six 100 times in a row. You know, at that point, you've got a question, is the dice playing fair? Um, because, you know, this was, and so it was a bit disappointing that um, the player, um, the player in that case um, wasn't even allowed to respond. Uh, I couldn't even really get through to the player because the parent was just so aggressive. How dare you, you know, accuse my son of cheating. And then the mum came in and started crying. And, you know, just was, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was difficult to actually get very far with that, with that particular case. Um, here's another situation, uh, same thing, top player uh, was, was, um, was removed because they're very far above everybody else. They're a long way ahead of everybody else. Senti Porn loss of 36, move match of 54. That doesn't, uh, you know, completely give it away, but, um, you know, the fact that they are just so far above everybody else, um, you know, does does really indicate that something wrong, something is going wrong here. Okay, and again, you can click into the game and you can see in this situation that maybe not all of the games was the player getting assistance, but only only some of the games. Okay, uh, the next one. Uh, okay, so this is again a very clear example where the top players are just like way ahead of where they should be. We've got a player with an eleven hundred rating getting a sort score of thirty nine. Okay, so a score, sort score of 39, and we'll see this in a second, is, is Grandmaster. Okay, so nobody other than Grandmasters are scoring above 40. It just, it just doesn't happen, a sort score of 40. Okay, especially over 216 moves. Over 10 moves, over 20 moves, over 30 moves, yeah, anything can happen. An 800 rated player can score, can score you know, 39, that's fine. Um, but over 200 moves, no way is anybody going to be scoring 39 if they're 1100. So again, this is a, a nice, easy example of disqualification uh, for both the top players. But you'll also notice that it's not just the sort scores that we're looking at, but you can also see like, why are they ranked number one and two when there's a 23, 24, 22, 24, 2500 rated players below them? In general, you should see roughly the best player at the top and descending in strength order because the person at the top of the list is the person who is playing most like a computer, okay? Stockfish is God, Stockfish is 3000 rating. Whoever's playing the closest to Stockfish is generally gonna be the strongest player. So it doesn't, it doesn't come in exact rating order, of course, but it, if you've got an 1100 rated player who's finishing above all of these 2500 rated players, that is something to be extremely suspicious about. 
you know, 1,100 or 1,500 rated players. They've also got this, uh, this magic, you know, move match of above 60%. And you can see all of these 22, 23, 24, 2,500 rated players, none of them are getting move matches above 60%. None of them are getting centi pawn losses uh, as 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 low as as these two players. So um, again, top two players, easy disqualifications. All right. So we've seen a few examples of easy disqualifications where people are just like the top players are way above everybody else. All right. Now, in a perfect world, you would notice these sorts of things after round three, for example. Round three is a good time because you get uh, you, you know you get usually get close to a hundred moves by round three. And you can start supervising these players and try and change their behavior before, before it kind of gets out of control. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where you, you go. Um, a couple of other quick things about these fair play reports. You've got this assessment button at the top. If you click that, you can choose manually any level that you want to assess at, A, B, C, or D. When you assess at level D, it will automatically go through A, B, and C as well. Um, there's no point assessing the whole tournament at level D. And when you're, when you're on the tournament report, you can do an assessment at level D. It's not going to give you any better results than the, 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 the system where some of them go A, some go D, some go C. Um, so I wouldn't bother with that. When you're on the fair play player report and you're just looking at that one player's games, if you're concerned about a player for some other reason than what Tornello is telling you, sure, click new assessment, go to level D, and you could... Um, you could get a deeper analysis on, on all of those games if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, there's, there's definitely no point in doing it for the whole tournament. If you do level D for the whole tournament, it's going to take a number of hours before it feeds back the results to you. So it's much more important to get real-time information than it is to get, uh, you know, level D assessments where it's going to go through and analyze every game four times, and it's going to take a number of hours to give you your report. All right, so we've got uh, we've got the easy ones. All right, let's look at the slightly trickier one. So this is a player who finished with a sort score of nine, rating of thirteen hundred. So straight away, this is a little bit suspicious, all right, because um, you know a, a player of thirteen hundred would usually be scoring in the negatives. Fifty five percent is a pretty high move match. It's not anywhere near the magic numbers of uh, of twenty or sixty though here. So this player is is really not um, not you can't certainly can't disqualify this player without additional uh, additional observational uh, evidence. Uh, we did have a further evidence in this case where we saw the player was consistently uh, looking away. Um, remember when we're screen sharing, we're not looking at screen sharing necessarily to see what's going on on their screen in terms of are they using Stockfish on their, on their computer, but it's more to see, can we build a story that tells us something consistent? You know, and if we see that the mouse doesn't move because their hands away from the chessboard and their eyes away from the chessboard, when their eyes and hands come back, the mouse starts moving again. This is what this is telling us that something, uh, you know, that this story that we're telling ourselves that the player is getting assistance is is kind of is kind of likely. But if you see the mouse is moving and they just happen to move their you know their head away and then they look back, then um, uh, you know maybe that's maybe that's not telling the story. So. Um, we we now we've we've now got this um, uh, these two these two selection panels at the top. We might have a look at some of those in a minute. Um, but you can actually you can actually now drill down a little bit and say, well, what about just looking at the four games or five games or six games? Okay, assuming that maybe somebody has had assistance not for every single game, um, and all of these statistics at the start, you know, these results here will, will show you all nine games. Okay, ah, good. Yeah. Uh, all nine games. So, you know, maybe maybe you're, you're suspicious that a player has only got assistance in seven games. So you change the number of rounds to seven games and you'll get just the results from seven games. Uh, this is still in beta, so you, you won't have access to this just yet. We'll release this to, to you as arbiters a little bit later on. Um, this other one is a smart cheating mode where you can see that the player's score of nine you put it into smart cheating mode and it jumps up to 19. Their move match goes from 55% to 62%. So by, by smart cheating, uh, we're removing some of the moves and not looking at all the moves. So here we're looking at 209 moves. When we swap it into smart cheating move mode, we're going to look at only 133 moves and we get a, a much higher score. So what you would expect if somebody's playing fairly is that their, that their percentages are about the same both, uh, you know, in both smart cheating and standard modes. All right. 
uh, if they're if they're cheating, then um, you know they, then then those numbers are going to be increasing. Um, quick look at uh, a Ken Reagan screening report. There are two types of um, two types of report that Kenneth Reagan will provide to uh, to you. One is a screening report, and the other one is is what he calls a deep analysis. All right, so this is a screening report. This was from the European uh, Corporate Tournament. Uh, so in a screening report, you again, if you want to look at just one number, look at the ROI. The ROI is a scaled number. Okay, by scaled number we mean that it is um, the same scale for um, based on based on rating. So if you've got a, a score of sixty and you've got a rating of eight hundred, you've got a score of sixty and a grandmaster, it means the same thing. Whereas the Tornello reports, okay, these sort scores are raw scores. So a score of nine, you'll get the same score if you're a grandmaster or a or a or a thirteen hundred rated player. A score of nine doesn't mean any means no problems for a for a grandmaster, but for a thirteen hundred player, it's a little bit sus. A score of nineteen for a grandmaster, no problems. Okay, what um, on a Ken Reagan report, the ROI is rating scaled. Basically, what it says is that the score of 50 is that you are playing exactly as expected for your rating, all right? But generally, anything between 40 and 60 is normal because, as you know, people play, you know, a bit above their rating sometimes or a bit below their rating sometimes. So um, uh, this, this will show you here the top ROI is only 60. This tournament, there's nothing to worry about at all. In this tournament, there's one player who's got an ROI of 71, but everybody else is below 60. So again, that gives you a pretty good indication that this player had some assistance because he's got a massive ROI um, compared to everybody else. Anything above 70 is, is significantly, uh, significantly worrying. Um, an ROI, you do have to make sure that the, that the ELO rating is correct. Okay, so we have seen cases, uh, you know, of players who've got very high ROIs, but it's because their rating is significantly wrong. So make sure you talk to the player, find out what their true strength is, because an ROI um, is is really, um, you know, is really relevant. Uh, it really relates to the, the 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 rating of the player. Okay. Uh, so let's see if we can get through this. Okay, so um, the next one that we'll have a look at is, oops, maybe I won't. Okay, let me, okay. All right, um, the next one I wanna have a look at is um, a Ken Reagan deeper analysis report. So, uh, okay, one thing to look at on the screening report is the ROI. If you are um, lucky enough to get a deeper analysis, let me quickly show you uh, a deeper analysis report. Okay. And uh, screen share. Oops. Again. Okay. So this deeper analysis, um, you'll get a report that looks like this: pages and pages of numbers, 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 all over the place, right? Um, columns and columns and columns of ratings, comms, preds, sigmas, like what the? It's it's a lot of stuff, right? So let's simplify it. There are really only two things you need to, to look at here. One is the IPR or internal performance rating. So that tells you how well the player played and it, that is not scaled according to the rating. That just tells you how well they played. So the player's got a rating of 2,600. He's performed at 2,051. It's like a performance rating in a tournament, but it's a performance ba rating based on the moves that you played, not a performance rating based on the results of the games. So normally you'll get a performance rating from a tournament, but it's a result it's based on your results. Like, okay, I won 50% of my games against an average rating of 2,200. Therefore, my performance rating is 2,200. This doesn't care who you played against. It doesn't care whether you won or lost. It just looks at the performance rating of your moves. Okay, and so that's a pretty cool statistic. 
be aware that your performance rating, uh, if you get a performance rating of over 3,000, that doesn't mean you're cheating, right? We've seen plenty of players who are grandmaster players, obviously grandmasters, who are getting performance ratings of 3,000. So you can easily get a performance rating of your on your on on, a, on your moves of 300 or 400 rating points above your actual rating. Okay, so we've seen as in also seen players with a rating of 1900 getting 2400 performance ratings on their moves. So the performance rating on the moves can be significantly higher than than your rating. Right, that doesn't necessarily mean disqualify them. But if you've got a performance rating of 3000 for a player who's 1100. Well, now that's a problem, okay? That should be disqualification, okay? Because they're not going to get a 2,000 performance, 2,000 ahead. I mean, you can get 300, 400, maybe at a stretch, you can get 500 points. Um, but yeah, once once you've got a 1,000 or 2,000 point differential, something's going wrong. So, but again, make sure your rating in the first place is right. So the internal performance rating, and the second one is this COM Z, COM Z. It's a combined Z score. So a Z score is your statistical um, statistical analysis, which tells you like uh, you know how likely are you to be playing fairly, all right? And the higher your Z score, the further away from normal bandwidth you are. Okay, so you become more and more of an outlier. Okay, it's a it's a it's a lower and lower chance that you're going to be uh, playing fairly. So just look at this one column. I know there are millions of Z scores all over the place. You can see them everywhere. You can end up with like eight or 10 different Z scores. Just forget about everything else. Just look at these two columns. If you get one of these reports, your internal performance rating, and um, you know, if you're going to just look at one thing only, it would be your, your combination of all the Z scores. And you're, you're looking for a Z score uh, above 2.75 if you've got significant uh, evidence that is physical evidence that, that tells you something suspicious is going on, you could, you could look for two, above 2.75. If you don't have significant evidence, like a phone in the person's bag or you know, a picture of them with a phone on the screen or something like that, you want your, your Z score to be uh, you know, a, a four and a half or something like that. Something, you know, very, so four and a half is like, you know, one in one in uh, one in a million chance that they're playing fairly. So um, yeah, your your Z score uh, and your your internal performance ratings will, will give you all the information you need from a Ken Reagan report. Um, all right, I now want to show you a fair report. So somebody who's played in Tornello tournament uh, and everyone's played fairly. So uh, let's have a look at this one here. Okay, so this is the uh, European Club Cup Finals. So this is a tournament with, uh, I don't know. Okay, the finals has only got 50, uh, 50 players, but there's 11 of them above 2,700. So we're talking about the best possible players that you could have in a, in a, in a, in a tournament, right? These are. 26, 2700 players, okay? The top players are getting sort scores of under 40. We've got a couple of people, so three people have managed to get, uh, you know, uh, well, actually there's a couple more down here. We've managed to get some move matches above 60%, all right? But not many, all right? And we're, we're talking about some seriously good players here. Remember, these guys are above 2700, all right? They're all grandmasters. So if you're seeing sort scores of, uh, of, of close to 40, um, you can see in a in a in a over in a online tournament, um, you know, grandmasters. This was what 10 plus five time control. Um, grandmasters are, 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 are top grandmasters. I'm not just talking your average run of the mill grandmasters. We're talking about some seriously good players here. Are scoring in the in the 30s and close to 40. Okay, it'll be a little bit different if you're a grandmaster playing against a 1200 rated player. Uh, you should be able to win more easily, um, but it won't be, you're not going to get significantly different, right? Um, and of course, you've also got to look at the number of moves that's been played. So, you know, so these, are, these are people who've played, you know, 200, 300, 400 moves. If I looked at just the best two rounds, for example, um, you're going to see much, much higher scores. So look at that. We've got, if we look at just the best one score, you, we should see something maybe an 80 or something like that. There you go. We've got a few 75s. So, um, you know, in one game, anything can happen, right? 
anything can happen. A hundred is kind of the, the maximum sort score you can get. So it's out of a hundred. Um, but then as you add more and more and more games, okay, we're going to end up, uh, you know, the scores are going to kind of um, average out, right? Because like you can roll a six, you can roll two sixes in a row, you can roll three sixes in a row, but it becomes less and less likely that you're going to roll the fourth and the fifth and the sixth six. So eventually your score is going to have to drop because you're going to roll a one. Okay, that's just how that's just how statistics works. So we've got some really high scores. Um, what have we got? Seven players above 30. All right, and then everybody else is below 30. Now, even these top grandmasters, we've got a bunch of 2,600 rated players who are scoring negative scores. Okay, so you know it is absolutely possible for for good players to score very low scores. Okay, um, it's it's just very unlikely that a not so strong player is going to be scoring very very high scores. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, the 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 the, sum, the summary of that uh, is is just try and focus on one uh, you know one statistic in in each report to make your life a little bit easier. Take that as evidence, but it is it should only be one part of your case against the player. All right, um, you should be. I mean, in a in a perfect world, you would see uh, you would see you know two or three points of, of, of evidence that are all telling the same story and all pointing in the same direction. You would have some statistical analysis, you would have some supervision so you could see what's going on um, and that all of that would be pointing in the same direction. Okay, so we've got a Ken Reagan uh, screening report and then a, a deeper report if you need to. Um, and then you've got the Tornello one. What I like above about Tornello is, is the fact that it is real time. So it should be it should be there as a tool for you to uh, identify which players you need to pay closer supervision attention to, right? If you've got eighty people or hundred people in your tournament, you can't supervise all of them. It's just not possible, right? You want to pick three or four people that you can pay attention to, and you pick the ones that are most likely to to be getting some uh, getting some help. So um, yeah, your your magic numbers uh, are there. Um, Yes, I mean, Maha's asked above 60% move match and, and above and, and below 20 in centi pawn loss. So it's it's above in move match, but below in centi pawn loss. So they're going opposite directions, those two scores. Um, uh, a centi pawn loss of below 20 is suspicious. But remember, in one game, anything's possible. And those scores are raw scores. So if you've got a 1100 rated player with a 55% move match, that's pretty suspicious. In itself, straight away, okay. Um, over over a large number of, let's say, two hundred moves or one hundred and fifty moves or something like that. So um, you know, just be aware that you've got a, a large enough sample size to make it to make it uh, valuable. Um, so if anybody has a specific case that is uh, an, an individual person or a tournament that they would want to, that they would want to look at. Um, I'm going to stop the. Maybe, uh, maybe you want to mention uh, differences uh, in uh, time control, uh, what it does to the numbers. Uh, there was also a question about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, faster time controls, the numbers will be lower. So you're going to get a lower move match, you're going to get a lower sort score in a faster time control. Um, the scores, you can use them to, as, as kind of benchmarks against the other players in the tournament. So if your best player in the tournament is a grandmaster and is getting a sort score of, you know, five, you don't want to see an 1100 rated player with a sort score of 25, right? That's, there's something wrong there, okay? You want to see roughly everybody in, uh, in kind of strength order. The best players at the top, the weakest players at the bottom. Anybody who's got a sort score of less than zero, uh, just you know, ignore straight away. Uh, a sort score of less than zero, it's it's just going to be kind of too hard to um, uh, to to even to even uh, you know really really identify any any sort of suspicious results. Um, uh, if you do, you're going to be then working on you know maybe like one or two games that are suspicious. So that's going to be a, a little bit hard to actually make a make a decision. 